Yo, what up? This is D-Night, and you're listening to the Pardon the Interaction podcast. My, oh, my, we've had so much going on. Uh, for starters, in case you missed it, we've got a new addition to the Par and Pie family, Tara Dublin. Make sure you go follow her on Twitter at Tara Dublin Rocks. Also, pick up a copy of her book while you're at it. Make, make her day, The Sound of Settling. A very fun and interesting read compared to the things we talk about on this podcast. <laughs> But yeah, we're heading toward the do or die time for the 2024 election. Go ahead and hit up JoeBiden.com. Get that man like a dollar a month or something. Help his campaign staff up and get prepared to try and save our democracy. And make sure to grab like one other person you know and tell them about the podcast. Make sure they subscribe and tune in every single week. We got a lot of things coming up for you this year. We need all the support that we can get. So if you do your part and help us grow our audience, we'll do our part and help elect Joe Biden in 2024 and save American democracy. And this is the Part of the Interaction Podcast. Hey, this is D-Night. Bum, 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 bum. And you're listening to the Pardon the Interaction Podcast. <laughs> it is me again. I have returned. I know you're probably sick of my fucking voice at this point, given that I've done like 47,000 of hours of content in like the last week or so. Uh, but we had a lot going on today. Emergency pod, you know, target letter day. Uh, to everyone who celebrates sorry psycho tuesday you got pushed off to the side and it's just me again today we'll have the girls back sometime this week of course uh oh let me give a shout out to our sponsor sheets and giggles colin the man he the ceo sent me some dope ass sheets they are fantastic along with a really nice sleeping mask as well and a really cute <laughs> t-shirt that tells me how good and bad i am <laughs> Not that he would know that firsthand. Uh, but yeah, the sheets are amazing. Again, highest quality sheets I've ever slept on in my life, uh, including in like the posh hotels and such. I would put these up there with those, uh, if not far surpassing them. So grab you a set of comfortable sheets, beds, pillowcases, and more from sheetsandgiggles.com. It's the shit. Also, sustainably sourced if you care about the environment and given that it's like 147,000 degrees everywhere on planet Earth right now, uh, you know, do your part to help save the world, I suppose, or at least not make it any worse. All right, so we had a lot going on today. First of all, I guess most importantly, Trump received his target letter in the Jack Smith 1-6 investigation. I told you that shit was coming. Who been telling you that for like weeks now that your boy Jack Smith was about the latest smackdown on Donald Trump? This guy right here on Pardon the Insurrection, D-Night. I've been telling you every episode, I was like, hey guys, it looks like it's about that time. I've been telling you. So tell everyone you know that D Knight predicted this shit would be coming and told you it would be weeks and not months. Let me pat myself on the back there one more time. I don't know if you can hear that on the microphone, but yes, that's me patting myself on the back because I fucking called this shit. Anyway, uh, we don't know the exact nature of the criminal charges Trump could be facing, uh, but according to the letter that was sent to Trump, by Jack Smith's team, it mentions three federal statutes, which are conspiracy to commit offense or to defraud the United States, which I assume to be a part of the fake elector conspiracy. There's also deprivation of rights under color of law and tampering with the witness, victim, or an informant. The letter doesn't include any other details, and it doesn't explain exactly how the special counsel believes Trump may have violated the statutes, according to the Rolling Stone. There's also no mention of the insurrection or sedition statutes in the letter, so we can assume that charges for those particular activities might eventually come, but don't expect them in the immediate future, so... It appears that Jack Smith's team is going to give Trump's legal counsel the opportunity to come and discuss with Jack Smith's team why Trump shouldn't be indicted. Uh, and he's supposed to do that, but they're only giving him up till Thursday, which means that anytime on Thursday or beyond, Trump could be facing yet another criminal fucking indictment. Woo! Go Jack Smith. Throw that man his flowers. 
like he prince i king and coming to america that boy good <laughs> uh one of the complications going on with this current set of indictments in florida though is judge cannon and all the mischief that she could potentially cause in that particular legal battle but one opportunity jack smith has to circumnavigate judge cannon's seeming biases in favor of helping trump Uh, one of the ways jack smith has the opportunity to circumnavigate that is by indicting trump in a different district and these particular criminal charges will likely be coming in washington dc a court system that is more aptly prepared to handle the criminal indictment of a former president given that cannon has little to no trial experience whatsoever i mean she has some, but not really. It's it's negligible. Um, also, given the jury concerns in Florida, the idea that Jack Smith's team would be able to choose an unbiased jury might be an uphill climb. But in D.C., I am absolutely certain that Jack Smith's team will have no such problem uh, in finding jurists who aren't just in the bag for Trump, no matter what the evidence is. So this could potentially create a scenario where regardless of what happens in the classified documents case in Southern Florida, uh, Trump could be on the hook here in D.C. and be on trial within a reasonable time frame, likely before the 2024 general election kicks off. Or at least that's what I'm assuming, given the fact that he'll be indicted in August here. And uh, let's say, you know, they... The judge gives them six months to go over the evidence and prepare for trial. I mean, that would put that sometime in the spring, right? So we could potentially have Trump be a convicted felon (laughs) in the middle of the Republican primaries. I mean, for fuck's sakes, how good would that be? Of note, in the documents case, Jack Smith's team and the grand jury down there is continuing their investigation which means that Trump could be potentially facing a superseding indictment in Southern Florida. But if that's the case, and the initial indictment was not the end of Jack Smith's work in the documents case, that also means that these charges Trump is facing in D.C. could only be the beginning and not the end. It's entirely possible after Trump is charged for these particular actions related to January 6th, that as the special counsel's team continues their investigation, that Trump could potentially be facing more charges in D.C. as well. We can only hope. Fingers crossed. Also, a number of individuals in Michigan, 16 Michigan residents, were charged for their role in the fake elector scheme by the Michigan State Attorney General today. The timing on this is likely not a coincidence. (laughs) So each of the defendants has been charged with one count of conspiracy to commit forgery, a 14-year felony, two counts of forgery, 14-year felonies, one count of conspiracy to commit uttering and publishing, a 14-year felony, and one count of actual uttering and publishing, also a 14-year felony. One count of conspiracy to commit election law forgery, which is a five-year felony, and two counts of election law forgery itself, a five-year felony. I am not entirely certain how Michigan State handles its sentencing guidelines. I will look into that, but assuming if it's anything like the federal system, uh, if convicted on all counts, they would likely not be serving those sentences consecutively. They would be served concurrently. And assuming they would get somewhere in the middle range of the guidelines, they could probably all be facing at least a decade in jail. (laughs) Kinds of fucking quinces, yo. We finally got some. We are working our way towards holding all these motherfuckers accountable. Thank God. But I imagine, uh, given that these particular individuals have been charged in such a fashion, that this is only the first of many indictments to come in a number of states around the country we know for sure Fannie Willis in Georgia is looking to indict a number of individuals involved with the Georgia fake electors but also we can imagine that Jack Smith's team 
is looking at a number of other states where this same plot was implemented. So we could see massive numbers of indictments just on fake electors alone. And that's not even including the individuals higher up the chain in the federal government who are involved in orchestrating the plot. So we likely have lots more news to come in this department. I'm assuming it won't take long for us to get it. And if you'd like more information on the Michigan fake electors or just the fake elector plot in general, I actually just released a new episode of the January 6th report right here on this podcast. My timing is impeccable because it is chapter three and that is all about the fake elector plot of which the Michigan fake electors feature prominently. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, given that you could just turn on that bad boy and let it ride. But (laughs) one of the things the Michigan electors try to do, given that Michigan state law requires that the electors certify their votes at the Capitol, (laughs) the fake electors... Uh, tried to enact a plot where they were going to sneak into the Capitol building and spend the night on the day before the date where they were to be certified. (laughs) So they could attempt to claim that because their votes were certified in the Capitol, they were somehow less fraudulent. (laughs) And, And like, I think it was Cheese Bro, he even said in an email, was like, oh, this could be a problem. (laughs) And then when they failed to pull that off, they were like, well, hey, let's just meet in secret somewhere, anywhere. It doesn't matter. But leave your phones at home and we'll just pretend like we were there. Some crazy shit. But yeah, there's a lot more information about them and the fake elector plot in general in chapter three of the January 6th report, which you can listen to right here on this podcast right now. It's already available. And make sure you share this podcast with everyone else who needs all the info and evidence contained in the January 6th report, but just doesn't feel like reading hundreds of puck- fucking pages. Like, I totally get it. <laughs> it's, it's exhausting. It is certainly an endeavor, one that I am trying to make more easily consumable in an audio format. I uh, hope you appreciate all my hard work on that front. Another thing, I think it was fairly clear this weekend that when Trump made that post on Truth Social, where he confused supposedly confused the insurrection act for the espionage act because he's under so many criminal fucking indictments he he can't figure out which is which (laughs) that it wasn't actually an honest mistake but instead trump got that fucking target letter and he knew charges were coming and he jumped the fucking gun and then someone must have put him off to the side and been like uh sir only you know you got the target letter they don't know maybe you want to fix that so he deleted the the insurrection act post and replaced it where he changed that one word and switched out insurrection for espionage so that was pretty fucking funny we're like hmm seems like he knows something that we don't and it turns out that was the case uh freudian freudian slip there on his part but i do appreciate him giving us a fair warning <laughs> As for my final thoughts here, uh, I think I'd like to say we should credit Mary Garland for the extensive amount of work that he put into bringing this investigation together, because a lot of this information collected by Jack Smith's team uh, in indicting President Trump, as far as 1-6 is concerned, a lot of that was done on, under Mary Garland's watch before Smith even got there, or at least as far as we know publicly. Um, of course, you know, Smith's had a number of months to expand upon that information. Um, but also, I also appreciate all the work that the January 6th committee done in this investigation. Because, again, if you listen to the report here, you see that they did a fantastic job of collecting the evidence and laying it out in a fairly straightforward fashion. in in such a way that, like, it's basically a prosecution memo for it you know jack smith's team to follow and while i appreciate all of their hard work i mean i i think the one thing i could say that they did that i might consider an error looking back on it now is their refusal 
to share the information that they were gathering with the Department of Justice in real time. Like, of course, now no one's going to remember this, but Merrick Garland's team actually started going down this rabbit hole before the January 6th committee even convened to begin their investigation. You know, they were seizing Jeffrey Clark and John Eastman's phones months before the first January 6th committee hearing. But if they had, instead of collecting all their evidence and then sharing it with the department after the fact, if they had done that as they were collecting it, and and look, I know one argument is like, hey, DOJ, you can just go and, you know, interview these people and gather this evidence. Uh, But also, if you have the evidence... Why not just share it with them and make their lives easier and be like, hey, we've got all this evidence. Go get these guys like we might could have been down the path of indicting Trump six months sooner in that case. Who knows? And that's and that's not to say again that I don't appreciate their work. I really do really, really do. Uh, They were part of the inspiration for this podcast, in fact, uh, because we were like, hey, we don't know what's going on at the Department of Justice, so we need to all try to do our parts to make this evidence and information publicly available. It's just that if there were one thing that I could change about the January 6th committee and the way they handled their investigation, it's just that. But look, man, we got here. That's what's most important. Hopefully, we'll get everyone involved from the fake electors at the bottom of the plot all the way up to Trump at the top and hopefully everyone in between. And you can follow all of those developments together here with us on the podcast. And that concludes this episode of Part of the Insurrection. <laughs>